All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, all these fellow panelists and all you folks watching at home. Um, we're really excited to be doing this panel series. Um, this series tonight is called Women in Theater, um, it's specifically for to talk about the experiences of women and those who have experienced uh, misogyny in theater um, or who have a, a women perspective. Um, before we get started, we want to announce we are doing a drive-in live theater production of Last Train to Mibrock. Um, that is happening real soon, October 8th through the 10th and the 15th through the 17th. Um, that's going to be taking place at 9 p.m. Um, in the parking lot, real near the Provo Town Center Mall where our theater usually is. Um, you can get more details and get tickets to that on our website. And while you're there, if you would like to help support our theater, um, you, there's also a donate button where you can become like a regular, like monthly donation supporter or just a one-time donation. This is a really tough time for live theater and we would love your support. All right, uh, let's get started. So first we're all gonna introduce ourselves. Um, we're gonna share uh, name, uh, pronouns, and uh, our current creative endeavor. So I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Liz Whitaker. There are two Liz's in this panel, so I'm gonna go by Liz Witt in this one. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and currently I am rehearsing a masked and distance production of White Savior at Pygmalion. We will be filming that in a huge room with 10 feet of distance apart from each other without masks and then making that available to audiences. And then I'm also directing a radio play production of Gaslight at Westminster. So that's me. Uh, I'm gonna popcorn Deliz. Hello, I am Deliz Joyner, um, and my pronouns are she, her. My current creative endeavors, unfortunately, most of my theatrical endeavors fell through, uh, but right now I'm getting to know a little bit about the film world and trying to reconnect with sketching. Nice. So. Uh, Chelsea, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Chelsea Hickman. <laughs> uh, my pronouns, she, her, and I guess creatively what I'm pursuing right now. Um, a reading of my new play, Tethered, will be happening in November with another. Hooray! It's a great play, I think. Mm -hmm. um, gay witches in the 1600s, it's wonderful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so that will be happening in November. Um, and other than that, I'm just teaching at UVU for their theater department, and it's going good. Yeah. Wonderful. Chloe, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chloe Tinney. Um, pronouns she, her, or they, them. Um, creative endeavors. Oh, God. Um, kind of just whatever I can find right now. Mostly just, like, various art things or mostly just art things, like, drawing or making posters for various theaters. Nice, wonderful. And Kim, introduce yourself. I'm Kim Abunawara and uh, excited to see my friends tonight. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm currently leading a um, seminar, a performance studies seminar um, um, on uh, virtual platform, which is really strange to be leading a, a performance studies seminar virtually, not when we're not all in the same room together. So um, that's really stretching us all, but it's, uh, it's really enjoyable. Um, yeah, so that's me. Awesome. And Shelby, will you introduce yourself? Of course. Um, my name is Shelby Newell Guest. My pronouns are she, her. Um, as far as creative and dinners go, it's keeping my plants alive through all of this wildness. Um, uh, this one is Elaine. So if you see something in the background, that's Elaine. Um, uh, 
Uh, other creative endeavors, I'm currently working on a devised piece with another theater company, um, a socially distanced masked devised piece, which is wild to figure out through Zoom, but it's been very fulfilling and very wonderful. And more information will come out that very soon. Uh, and that's me. Okay. Um, so to get us started, um, we wanted to talk about um, what is a script or story in theater that you love that embodies positivity in being a woman and what other stories would you like to see more of? So if you have a thought that you would like to share, please feel free to just chime in or raise your hand. Um, so does anyone have one that they want to start with sharing? Yeah, I do. I'll, I'll start. Um, um, much Ado About Nothing, I would say uh, Beatrice. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Harold Bloom, when he wrote uh, um, in his book, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, he talked about how he talked about Beatrice. And she, Beatrice is so powerful, so articulate. Uh, Beatrice has the answers. So um, in spite of the fact that she's written by a man, it's one of the most powerful and positive uh, expressions of womanhood that I can think of in the theater. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. There. There, yeah, yeah, I didn't even think to open my brain to classical, Kim. That's so, so wise of you. In fact, I name all of my plants after important femmes of history, and this is Beatrice, <laughs> so I'm glad you brought that up. Hey. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, anyone else have one that they want to share? Um, um, I, I, oh, sorry, Liz, go ahead. Go oh, ahead you're fine. I, I had a few come to mind. I had, uh, I thought of all the little women and little women. Um, I love Mary in Secret Garden. Um, I, I love Aldonza in Man of La Mancha because I feel like her journey is one of like coming to understand who she is and that she's a worthwhile person. Um, yeah, I, I also love women who aren't necessarily a hundred percent good. Like I, I think of like, um, Machinal because that character is so complex and so meaty and I, I feel like that's positive in that it represents like a woman as like a real like full dimensional person rather than a caricature. Yeah, I like that what you said about complexity because I think part of part of the problem is that throughout history there have been times where women are written as like only one thing. There's like the virgin whore dichotomy of like, you can either be Mary, mother of Jesus, or you can be Mary Magdalene and nothing else. <laughs> and so when women are allowed to have both strengths and flaws and complexities, that reflects reality in a much more interesting and engaging and powerful way. Yeah, I like that. Um, if I could throw in one more of those, and somebody please help me because I'm blanking on the name. But in Measure for Measure, the sister, um, oh, Olivia, Isabel, Isabel, <laughs> it, Isabel, Isabel, Isabel. Um, because yes, I do think that uh, given the that she was written by a man and and the predicament the predicament to use a small word um, that she goes through <laughs> in the story. Uh, but I think I've seen some modern adaptations to that that have been so like heartbreaking as well as um, breathtaking at the same time of like the human, like human interactions of like what women are expected to do and asked to do versus their own choices and what they decide to do with their bodies and what's seeing fit and what they use for boon within themselves for their loved ones. And I think it's a beautiful story. Yeah. If yes. I could share one female character yes. that I really love, okay, and that I think shows womanhood in a positive light. Um, I've recently been rereading A Raisin in the Sun, and all the female characters within that play are, I think, could be the atypical 
definition of what is positive about womanhood. Um, but I think in particular, Mama um, and her ultimate goal of wanting to love and protect her family no matter what the cost is, um, especially the um, time period within which the play was written as well as when it's set um, and the particular struggles that this family encounters in Chicago's South Side um, and then moving into Clybourne Park um, and those dynamics that happen there. But um, yeah, I think one beautiful metaphor that shows Mama's character um, is with her little house plant, mm, uh, Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so mama, mama has this wonderful house plant that she, uh, that she is worried about throughout the whole play. Um, and she doesn't know if it's going to be watered enough, if it's going to have enough sunlight. Oh, no. Oh, no. My camera. Oh, uh, hang on. <laughs> you figure it out. There. Oh, okay. Good. There we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so mama, she has this house plant that she cares for very deeply. Um, and uh, throughout the play, she's worried about this new home and where the plant will have a, the best chance of survival and will it get enough sunlight? Will it get enough water? Um, and I think this plant is a direct metaphor for how she cares for and worries about her own family and what the future will hold for them. How will they uh, have roots and grow? within this new society that we're all learning how to navigate. So, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I love that. Chloe, do you have any scripts or characters that you feel like embody positivity for womanhood? Yeah, I, I was thinking like, if we're going more modern, I was thinking like Matilda, even just finding like the positivity in Matilda's character and Miss Honey how they're both able to overcome really horrible circumstances through their own just like inner strength and intelligence and like even I think it's Matilda's song Quiet just like finding those introspective moments to like refine your own strength in really horrible situations. Yes, oh, I love that. The, the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about this idea was an experience I had um, buying a copy of Eve Ensler's The Vagina Monologues. Um, I grew up in like a very um, conservative uh, religious organization and the the way that I was taught about female sexuality and female bodies was as an object to be desired or acted upon or an object of temptation that there was no like agency and it was such a small thing but i was like just browsing the plays in the bookstore and i saw it and i was like oh it has that word in it <laughs> but i pulled it off the shelf and i opened it and i like started crying because it was a time where women could speak about their experiences and it wasn't just limited to only uh like one aspect of womanhood but it was also an aspect that allowed that allowed for that complexity and and i think allowing women to be whole um it's funny because now there's a part of me that it finds the title of the vagina monologues a little bit problematic, but <laughs> uh, we've all grown and evolved as we've understood gender and sexuality. But that's the kind of thing I would I want to see more in theater of women being allowed to be the things they haven't been allowed to be. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Preach. Um. To switch gears a little bit, um, many of us have experienced or witnessed um, misogyny or other uh, kind of negative or gender-based um, prejudice in theater. And talking about these experiences can be 
painful or triggering, but talking about them can also provide learning experiences for others. So does anyone have an experience that they wish would have been handled better? <laughs> I guess I shouldn't ask, has anyone? I say, would anyone like to share their experience? <laughs> Where... um, I mean, I, yeah, I'll jump on it. And I think a lot of you uh, people on this panel and other people in this world will understand is uh, that tactic or not even tactic, that thing where the director's like, can you be a bit more like, and they do that thing where they're like, like more sexy or like more, more saucy. And it's like, well, that, that, I don't know. What does that mean? And like the idea that we have this like innate ability to like lure people, which <laughs> is basically just brings it down to like the base fact of like Liz said, the fact that our bodies are meant to be like a temptation or to have a baby. And those are our two options. Um, my, one of my professors in school, Lisa Hall said this brilliant thing once that was a, uh, when, when writers don't know what to do with a, a woman, and this was specifically in television, but I think it applies to plays as well, uh, that they make them pregnant. Uh, like when they're at a loss of what to do with their storyline, they make them pregnant. And the idea that, um, I think, I think we've often had that experience of directors not really knowing how to, you know, or male directors, I guess I could say, knowing how to enter that kind of a conversation as respectfully and as purposefully as possible, which like, I think a lot of us have had enough acting training and experience to be able to know what to do with information, but to put on that, because I don't know if you would ever say to a man, like, can you just be sexy? They'd be like, can you be powerful? Can you be strong? Can you be perfect? Like, and there's so many other things that women, it's like, can you just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my thing is like the negative impact on women saying, can you just be this? Or like, can you just do this? And it's like, well, sure but can we have a further conversation as to one how that serves the scene and two uh using my actual training as an actor to bring forth your vision yes I'll, i'm going to circle back to that idea later in this panel uh one of the things i was thinking about is i i feel like i've been fortunate where i haven't experienced a lot of like gender-based um like speech or or harassment but i sure have been talked over a lot oh my <laughs> sure God. i've been interrupted a lot and uh because you know sometimes there are moments in rehearsal especially when you're trying to figure out blocking or there's a problem of like we need to get the raincoat from that side of the stage to this side and i'll start to say what if we, and then someone will be like, I have an idea. Why don't we do this? <laughs> and so I've really, I have really appreciated. There was one re rehearsal that I was in once where the director was a woman and one of the male actors was doing that. And she interrupted him and was like, excuse me, so-and-so was still talking and he ignored her and just kept talking. So she just ignored him. Like she didn't respond to anything that he said and just turned back to the person he interrupted and said, finish your thought. What were you saying? <laughs> just ignored him. And I was like, yes, that is the template. Yes. I have a story that I would like to share. <laughs> story. Okay. So, and just as like a forewarning, there is a mention of rape within this story dealing with the context of a play. So I just want to make that known. Um, so this happened while I was in grad school, and it was in a playwriting workshop. And um, the class was about 15 people, and 14 of them are women, one was a man, and then we had a male professor. So those were our class dynamics. And this male playwright, he first off didn't send in his pages ahead of time. We literally got them 15 minutes before class was going to start, which is already you know, not professional. <laughs> uh, so we had no time to read through his pages before we were there to get ready for class. Um, so we were reading these live with one another with live reactions. And that's important because of what happened within these pages. <laughs> so uh, he wanted to write a play that was based in film noir, which is rad. That's cool. Um, but the opening scene to this play um, was from a man's perspective. Um, he was an ex-war veteran, yes. Um, he walks through the audience onto the stage at the very beginning of the play, which is like 
maybe a red flag. Anyway, so, <laughs> so this male character walks through, through the audience to get on stage. He starts his monologue at the very beginning. Um, and, and very quickly, we realize that this monologue is a story about this male veteran and how he witnessed a woman in the uh, Middle East uh, be raped and then killed and her daughter witnessing those horrific acts against her mother. And it was not from the perspective of the female character that went through it. It was from the perspective of the male character and his trauma that he experienced watching something like that happen. And um, there were no um, sort of restrictions on the violence that was written into the script. It was there in the stage directions. Um, and because once again, we're reading them live and I was asked to read stage directions for this scene, I couldn't edit. I couldn't, it was happening in live time. So um, it, was, it was horrific and the room, the atmosphere went cold. And I could notice that my male professor, he was really starting to notice that the um, female classmates in the room, the majority of us were getting very uncomfortable. Um, so we went on a quick break. I went out in the hall and I cried. <laughs> we all came back and uh, we had a very frank conversation about the language that was being used um, within his script, the unprofessionalism in how he sent his pages. Um, also, the lack of um, accountability that the male professor had with that male student. That was also very eye-opening um, of uh, not handling the room as best as he could have. Um, it was an eye-opening experience, I think, for all of us. Um, but yeah, one question I asked him was, well, Oh, the playwright, I was like, well, so was it your intention to alienate half of your audience <laughs> with this scene that you've written with this horrific act against a woman at the very beginning of your play? How are you going to earn our trust back? Um, you know, are you going to put any sort of trigger warning in the program? Are you going to think about anything that could keep everyone in this room safe? And he hadn't thought of those things. <laughs> so that's my story. <laughs> Yeah. I, ugh, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. I, I, it makes me think of, I was recently in a, in a class, a film class where, uh, I was learning to be like a, um, a script reader who, you know, gives notes on, like, story editing, right? And, we just would get sent random scripts and we would have to, you know, read through them and give notes on, you know, just the basic plot and like what we thought was good, what we thought was bad. And so many of the scripts that I would get sent, because I had to read so many of them, but it was astonishing to me, the number of scripts written by men that would be like, and here's this horrific violence that happens to women that is in there literally just to motivate the main character and and that's it like and it would be in like gruesome graphic horrible detail <laughs> and then and she just doesn't exist as a character like she's just there for 10 minutes to get brutalized and then motivate the main character and i would always be like torture <laughs> porn's not okay like <laughs> you know <laughs> like <laughs> like yeah. find a better way to motivate your character so yeah. wow yeah. <sighs> Kim or Chloe do you have experiences that you want to share yeah um kind of jumping on yours um Liz Witt um I noticed especially like as I was transitioning and working backstage at theater um just how much more people started to talk over me and how I would like come up with ideas or solutions to fix things. And like, they wouldn't take the advice. And then like five minutes later, a guy would come up with the same solution and they'd do it. And they're like, Oh, this is great. This worked perfectly. And, and I'd be sitting there going, I, okay. So it was really interesting to kind of, I guess, lose the privilege as time went on um and like i'd been aware of it before transitioning um but just being super in it was very eye-opening 
and I guess just made me realize how common it is every damn day. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if maybe because so many um, really excellent examples have been given about, uh, you know, real blunders, real, real um, bad examples. Um, if it'd be all right, if I sort of inverted the question and because for whatever reason, when I was thinking about the question, I was thinking about um, a situation that was handled really well. And I wanted to just uh, share that I was working with a, <clears throat> I was working with a, a really gifted young male director on a new script and uh, and um, we'd been rehearsing for a while and we came to this scene uh, that um, he and he gathered us I was in the scene with another uh, young man I was playing his mother and the director got us together and he said um, and he said so I think that this scene is he said i don't think that the scene is finished i think that it, it's written well but i don't think it's quite met its potential this scene so i what i'd like to do is give you permission to in the scene i would like you to find the zenith of the scene i'd like you to and to be trusted like that was extraordinary and uh, so I just wanted to offer that as an example of just exceptional directing and uh, collaborating um, where a director just empowered me and said, um, I, and in not in so many words, just said, believed that he thought that we could find it together, that we would follow this, uh, the, um, the, the honest exchange between us. And then this scene would, would go to where it needed to go and, and I thought that was a I thought that was some of the best uh direction I'd ever received it was exciting oh yes I love that yes <laughs> um really quick uh I'd like each of us to go around and mention um a couple of women in theater that you love to follow or uh admire and if we kind of do um the word isn't speed dating but that's the idea if we kind of like bam 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 uh just like kind of whip through it and then um we can also so like people who are watching you can be like i'm gonna write this down to google it so get your pens ready um i will start uh, there is a woman named Claire Warden who is um, part of the creative team at Intimacy Directors and Coordinators. She was the very first intimacy coordinator or director on Broadway. Uh, she's the first woman to be nominated for and win a Drama Desk Award for fight choreography. And she is insightful and sensitive and brilliant and I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we'll just go around. Shelby, who you got? Okay, um, I'm gonna cheat. I have two. Um, the first being um, Ruth Carter, who is a costume designer in film, actually, but her as an artist and her ability, she's uh, right now most well known for Black Panther um, and what she did and how she just did so many incredible things with so many incredible people and her wardrobe design and everything is just everything I ever wanted. And the other one I know is an oldie but a goodie, Susan Laurie Parks, who just radicalizes the theater world every time she puts something out with a new story that comes from so many different angles and backgrounds and experiences that just boggle my mind every single time I read her. Ah, uh, awesome. Uh, Deliz, who's yours? Um, this, honestly, the first person that came to mind was Yasmina Reza. I love her plays. I'm obsessed with her. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of an older one. Um, and other than that, I, people that I know, like, I'm obsessed with all of you, honestly. <laughs> same. Yeah, same. <laughs> awesome. Chloe, how about you? Um, I'm going to say, like, women who have really incredible command of the stage when they're on, like, performing, like Bernadette Peters or, um, like, Audra McDonald, who 
have this innate ability to just walk onto a stage and like demand your attention with their talent. Um, and if we're going to go local, I would say um, that Laura Chapman also has that ability. She's done stuff at Ann Other. Um, she was Yitzhak in Hedwig and killed it every single night. Accurate. How about you, Kim? Uh, I'd have to say Elizabeth LeCompte, who's the founder of the Wooster Group. And I think the, um, she, she continues to do some of the most um, innovative, creative, um, formal bending work, right? She, she's bending and pressing the edges of the art form all the time. Yes. Oh, I love that. How about you, Chelsea? Um, I, whenever I get the chance to talk about Melissa Leilani Larson, I will do it. <laughs> so uh, she's a local Utah playwright um, and, and just a beautiful soul. Um, I have loved every one of her plays. They are careful, they are considerate, they are deep, and they are um, paving the way for female characters in a really gorgeous way. Um, my favorites of hers, Pride and Prejudice, that adaptation. I also love Little Happy Secrets is another one of my favorite plays of hers. Um, and then uh, one of her films came out last year, Jane and Emma, and I love that as well. So that's my rock star female artist. <laughs> we are so lucky to be so surrounded by so many like incredible artists and theater makers and so many like women who are like not only being not only exceptional in their craft but like expanding the scope of what theater and what performance and what acting and design can be like we for those of us who can't afford the cost of living in new york or chicago or la like we have it in like provo <laughs> in like salt lake city it's like so cool to me awesome mm -hmm. um Thank you for that quick little round robin. Um, I want to talk about what experiences in theater um, have shaped your expression as an artist. Um, I'll go ahead and start and just say I have done um, three summers of uh, summer stock theater at a theater in West Yellowstone, Montana called The Play Mill. Um, yeah. And, I've done, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I've also done runs of shows at the Hill in West Valley. Um, and the thing that I feel has shaped me most as an artist is just spending hours and hours and hours and hours on stage in front of an audience, um, especially with a really long run of a show. Um, doing summer stock at Playmill, you are doing 13 shows a week. Um, you're doing three different shows in rep. So Monday, let's see, Monday, Thursday, uh, and Saturday night, you will be doing two performances of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. And Tuesday, Thursday, you will be doing two performances of Fiddler on the Roof, and then Wednesday, Friday, I forget what days I'm on. Anyway, you're doing like so much, and you're doing that from like July to September. And so when you have done like this same role, like around the 60th or 70th performance, you have to keep it new, because it's not new for you, but it's new for the audience. And so there are like tricks that people do. Some people are like, well, we'll play a game where we pass a playing card around on stage and the audience can't find it. But the more meaningful <laughs> method would be to pick a person in the audience and say, this show tonight is for this person. I am performing for this person. And just the sheer relentlessness of performance um, helps you understand what aspects of acting are just a skill are just you know if i were to like method act my way into the role of mrs bixby in seven brides for seven brothers i don't think i would survive the summer but like 
if you're like, okay, this is who this person is. These are the physical skills. This is the emotional journey. Um, that's really like shaped my work and I will be forever grateful for it. Uh, so what about you guys? What experiences have shaped your expression as an artist? And it could be either things that you have done or things that you have watched, which I guess opens like 8,000 doors. <laughs> <laughs> but does anyone have one that they want to share? share. Um, I, mine is a mentor of mine. Um, um, a really significant mentor in my life was a woman named Barta Heiner, who's kind of a local celeb. Um, but I, I learned a lot about the theater from her and um, and I was in several shows with her and she would always gather us before a show and, and you know, sort of good thoughts, collect your energy uh, before the show began. And then she would always say this phrase, give the gift. And that's something that I've always kept with me. It really left a mark that every performance is a gift. It's not for you. It's, and, it, and it really helped to take that, that really threatening uh, self-conscious inward focus uh, that we battle in acting and turn it out to give, give it, give, give it away, give the gift. So that shaped me. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I now want to like take that and put it in my own practice. Um, Chloe, I saw you had your hand raised. Yes, um, I was going to say, um, I find that the theater that kind of gives me the most artistic boost are the shows that have really huge stories and very minimal like sets or props or just, or like low budgets. Um, uh, just an example, um, I saw the show Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime in London um, several years back. And that one's a very minimalist show, but um, it was on the West End and it was super flashy and high budget, really cool. Um, and then they did it here at another, I'm just gonna keep promoing the theater because it's incredible the things that they're able to do in that space. Um, but there wasn't the same like level of ginormous set pieces or things that they could do, but the little tiny details that were put into just like individual set blocks or even just in the staging of it, the direction, the lighting, just so many tiny, perfect, intricate little pieces came together and it was magic to watch every single time. Oh, that makes me so happy. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you guys, I'm telling you, another theater company. If you haven't seen our shows, come to our shows. Right now you have to come to a drive-in, but one day we'll be back in that old space that used to be a radio shack and make more magic there. We'll make magic in a parking lot. Um, does anyone else have one that they uh, have an experience that they want to share? I might have one. Uh, I think often when I've grown as an artist, it's when I failed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, because that's where you really get to see um, how much more you can improve and what more you can offer when you're at your lowest. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, and I have many of those experiences. They're not the best, but you know, they've given me a lot to think about. Um, I think uh, anytime an audition happens and I think I did well and it does not, go in my direction I'm like oh, okay well i'll get i'll let i'll gladly give that to somebody else so they can experience it um with my writing uh um we did a production of a play that i wrote called safe with another um in january and february and there were ooh, <clears throat> there were many times um while i was working on that play where uh male colleagues um they would read the play and they would um, put up a lot of obstacles um, in what the story needed to be. Um, and I would often feel that I was a failure as a playwright because I wasn't meeting those expectations of my male colleagues in telling the story that needed to be told. Um, but as I 
worked through that and realized that, no, I'm not a failure um, and that I have a voice to offer, um, really beautiful things happened. And my story lived on its own. And the characters told me what they needed their story to be and not what those male colleagues thought it should be. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'm so, I'm so glad that you found your way away from those incorrect suggestions <laughs> and that you trusted the story that you had to tell because it was a beautiful story and I, I feel so honored to have been a part of telling it. Um, Shelby, uh, I thought you were about to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was going to tell a story which actually this is also a production I worked with Chelsea on. Um, uh, uh, two year, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, I can't remember. There's so many shows that happen in such a small amount of time. Uh, but we did Taming of the Shrew together, which is very much a production that people have a, a hard time with for so many understandable reasons. Um, but I met with uh, Chelsea, who was our adaptress, and um, our dramaturg, uh, and we sat down and we talked about the idea of making this story Catherine's instead of anyone else's because the story should revolve around her and nobody else in my opinion um i love giving i love reinventing some stories and giving you know voices to characters and so we didn't i mean chelsea can attest we didn't we didn't change any words we didn't add any language like we just left the story we just cut it in a very specific way um which revolved around the idea of intimate partner violence and what that does to a person and um the biggest question i get whenever i tell people about this production which was part of chelsea's just magnified ability to be an incredible playwright um was the last monologue of catherine's and how she gives that speech about how women should act and we went through the whole play with just following catherine's journey of being in this abusive relationship and and in a million different ways with her husband petruchio and um I remember Chelsea posed a question to me very, very early on in the process of like, I don't want to write a script about someone who gets abused and doesn't have like some kind of like outlet or nobody knows at the end. And so after talking, we devised a way that um, after Catherine's big speech that she actually ends up just giving to the widow and Bianca, um, she leaves to exit and as, uh, as Bianca reaches out to stop her, she grabs her shawl and then notices a large grab mark bruise on her arm and yeah and the two of them have this beautiful movement um thank you i'm glad you like it liz wit um the two of them have this beautiful like movement exercise and then basically like everyone comes back in and they're like okay party's over everybody go home and um the idea that like that lives on and then not many people know i haven't been incredibly public about it but when we started that project i had been dating somebody and then a few weeks before um we uh been mounted it we, it was a two-week rehearsal process it was very fast um two weeks before we started rehearsals i had ended a relationship with an abusive um partner of mine and it was not only the validation that within this story was there like a part of me but in this story were my instincts and my feelings and my values and me as a woman was being validated through a script that i had found and that my artistic intentions Cor can correlate with my feelings and I'm not just being emotional I'm not just being like a really really sensitive to other people or I am not giving men enough credit for being who they really are and just being tough and they you know go get them tight people but that I was able to find an end for me and then finding that end for Catherine and hopefully that story bleeding into other people's lives and becoming a safe story for them as well yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Shelby. Thank you for your um, for your vulnerability in sharing that. Um, I also just want to take a moment and say uh, that if you are uh, experiencing uh, partner violence right now, any of you who are watching, there are resources. There are safe places. Um, there are resources. I'd encourage you to. Um, if you are able to simply Google women's shelters in your area or hotlines um, to get you the resources that you need to uh, exit that relationship when you're ready. Um, Deliz, before we switch gears, do you have an experience uh, in theater that you wanted to uh, share? 
shaped your expression as an artist? It's my expression. You know, I've, I've had amazing mentors. Um, I, I think the biggest thing for me has been learning to trust myself. Um, I'm, I'm a very like analytical person and, and I've worked on so, so, so many shows in so many different capacities and, and every show that I watch, if it's a show that I feel like is good, I'm like, why is it good? What made it good? Why, I, you know, I want to figure out why it's good. And if it's bad, I'm like, what made it bad? How would I have fixed it? You know, and learning to trust that like, yeah, like I'm, I know what I'm talking about. And like, I have absorbed all these things and I have learned a great deal from working in theater. And I'm, I'm not just making that up. I, I, I finally got to the point where I was like, yeah, I want to direct because I had been stage managing for so many directors for so long where I'd be like, that was a terrible decision, <laughs> you know, like in my opinion, obviously, but I, I, I finally was like, no, like I, I know I can do this. And so I got some training and I started doing it and it's, yes. you know, it's just been a process of like learning that I can do it and not listening to the, both the voices in my head and also the people that unfortunately have told me that I can't. So. They're wrong. <laughs> so wrong, so wrong, so wrong. Uh, thank you guys. I'm like so hyped up on like how awesome everyone here is. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to ask, um, I want to talk briefly about what uh what you do in your work to create a safe space for women um or if you have kind of heard of something else or seen something else done uh because then also those who are watching can be like oh i'm gonna try that um so i'll share one thing that has really been helpful because the awesome thing is that when you work to make uh, theater a safe space for women, it kind of automatically makes it a safer space for everyone. Um, one of the biggest changes in my work has been switching from yes, no questions to open-ended questions. So instead of saying, is it okay if he grabs your arm in this scene? To say, how would you feel about some physical contact in this scene? Or how do you feel about the idea of doing this? Or how do people feel about rehearsal? That if you just switch it from, are we good? <laughs> Cause that ignores the power dynamics to say, how do you feel about? Because then it allows people the space to kind of, to advocate for themselves much more easily than just to like, it's really difficult to say no, especially as women, women are socialized to not say no, because we might hurt someone's feelings and it's our job to make sure that no one's feelings are hurt. But if you're not okay, if you're like, no, I don't want him to grab my arm in this scene, it's really hard to be like, no. <laughs> but if you say, how do you feel about that? You can say, I feel uncomfortable about that. Is there a way we can do it another way? So that's been a really big, a really big shift in my work to go from yes, no questions to open-ended questions. Um, what other things do you guys do to make theater safe? Yeah, Shelby. Um, anybody who's ever worked with me before uh, knows that I, as a director, have like mountains of paperwork to fill out when you even audition, um, which like have like the things that like for some reason we still in the theater world have yet to like get into, like, like pronouns, like can you, it should be like, what is your name? What are your pronouns? Like that should be like the first thing, first of all, to go on your audition sheet so that when someone hands it to you when they walk in the door, you don't say to them. Um, but then as far as like, so in having that open ended conversation and I don't, and this is more coming from a woman who is plus size slash a straight who can find her size in multiple different stores, but still is like a curvy woman that we still put like height and weight on our audition forms, like not even like a form that you might need to fill out for the costume shop later. We're still putting down how many, like what is, what is your dress size? How much do you weigh? Like, I don't know why we're still doing that for auditions. It doesn't actually matter. But as far as for me, after that point, I go through a lot of different forms with my actors of like, 
in a brief sentence, tell me what you are and are not comfortable with on stage. And that way our first rehearsal is mostly table work. I can take that home, re review it with everybody, make sure work sounds good with my stage manager, with intimacy choreographer, whoever it might be to be able to say, okay, this thing that we thought we were going to do, not doing it. Let's find another way to do it. So that there's less in, in time rehearsal for me to be like, okay. And it's not me being like, tell me about really a traumatic time in your life on a piece of paper right now but just like super basic information of like i don't like to be grabbed by my shoulders great that's something we can make work that's something that we can make sure doesn't happen or if it does happen address it when it does so that's how i like to frame things in my rehearsal room and what i do love that i'm gonna i'm gonna make a small plug for intimacy directors um partly because I am one and so I want to plug myself, <laughs> but also because I'm passionate about it and it's important. Um, I am not the only one in this area. Uh, Kylie Azure Green is another incredible intimacy director who also has a really strong fight choreography background. Um, Liz Golden has experience in this. Uh, Sarah Shippabotham has experience in this. Um, if you are doing any kind of simulated sexuality or intimate violence on stage hire an intimacy director because they have specific training that can help make your rehearsal room safe and it's amazing it's so great um okay yeah uh who had their hand raised i saw someone raise their hand yes deliz i did um so a, gr a lot of my background is in like stage management and tech and i was just thinking about like how much mansplaining I have experienced in my life and I when I'm stage managing like one of the main things that I really try to put forth is like who you can talk to and who is in charge of what and you know I feel like if you're very clear about like this is the person you can talk to about this and if you're concerned about this you can talk to this person and just really on the first day be very clear about who knows about what and how and who to talk to about what rather than just being like yeah yeah we're here whatever let's just get started it makes it easier so that you don't have people being like oh you're new huh well let me talk to you about this you know and it's like okay but like i'm also working here and <laughs> right you know what I mean? Also like, I feel like there have been so many boss. conversations where I've been like, are you my boss? Are you training me? Did I ask you? Did <laughs> like, I even ask? Did I even <laughs> ask? Ugh. Yeah. And, and like, the situations where that hasn't been a problem has been like, where my boss has been like, hi, let me introduce you to so and so. If you have questions, you can talk to them. And it's like, great. We know the relationship here. We understand what's going on. It's not like this weird, everyone just go in the space and nobody knows what's going on. And, and oh, you're new? Let me teach you everything. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not that's, a thing I need, but thank you. Yeah, that's really, really wise. Having those kind of clear, clear boundaries. Um, anyone else have, uh, have suggestions of like what you do to create a safe space for women? Um, as a professor uh, and in my classrooms, I do try very hard to make it as safe of, a, safe of a place as possible, regardless of who is in the class. And I will say that I think I've, I've gotten better at doing that over the um, course of me teaching. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I had an experience a few semesters ago where the safety, um, emotional safety of some of my students was being challenged by another student. And we addressed the problem Im immediately and we got it taken care of. And at the end of class, um, a few female students came up to me and said, I don't know how I would have handled it if you hadn't have been able to step in. Thank you for being my professor. Thank you for taking care of me because I wouldn't have been able to stand up for myself, but thank you for um, being there for me. So anyway, that's just one way that I try to do with keeping my students safe in my classroom. Yeah, be, being willing to like call bigotry out or to stand up in someone's defense or to say, hey, that's not cool. We're, we're not doing that right now. 
is so empowering to everyone in the room because it also means that in all of the different kind of categories of privilege that we have, if someone, if there's like racism happening in the room, I, as a white American, don't experience racism. Reverse racism is not a thing. Um, <laughs> but if I see racism happening and someone calls it out and is like, hey, that's not cool, it means that I feel safer as a woman because it makes me feel like, oh, okay, well, if someone says something sexist, I'm allowed to say like, hey, that's not cool. So just yep. the act of calling it out is so empowering. Um, Kim or Chloe, do you have any thoughts you wanted to share on this of like how to make a safe space for women? Um, I am learning so much listening to this because I feel like um, when I read the when I read the question about safety, um, so all, all my experience in the theater is as an actress. I, I only act. I've never been a director. In the classroom. You'd be great, Kim, as soon as you want to. I'm in the audience or in the audition. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I um, but like uh, Chelsea, I, I do teach and I do have a responsibility in my classroom to create a safe space. So I understand that, but I've been thinking uh, since I got these questions about Margaret Atwood's um, uh, discussion of safety from versus safety to. Um, and I think that I'm learning so much from all of you about how to, I mean, I didn't study directing, I studied acting and, and at the heart of acting, is learning to not be safe. So I think that all of you are talking about safety from, which needs to happen so that then I can be safe to do my job, which is to take risks. The best art, the most compelling theatrical magic happens when we take risks. That's, that's what it's all about. But I guess we can't, we can't, do that unless we were first safe from bigotry, violence, uh, discrimination. But at that point, we are safe to, for, from my point of view as an actor, uh, to take risks because that's when the best work happens. That's like the most brilliant thing. <laughs> like, yes, that there's like, there's this kind of, there's the comfort zone and then the growth zone and then the trauma zone. <laughs> and so if we're, we're not, we're not trying to be over here in trauma zone, but I hadn't even thought about like, we can't, yeah, we can't have safety to, unless we have safety from, I love that. Uh, Chloe, do you have any thoughts on this before we do our final question? Yeah, just a quick one, kind of jumping on what you said about like people being able to call things out. Um, I think, just like being able to have open conversations about um, just like identity or sexuality, like especially again at another, where it's just kind of part of people's lives. It's not this taboo thing that needs to be quieted in a professional space or something that everyone has to conform to like a predetermined standard. It's just, these are who the people are, here are their talents, and let's utilize everyone's skills appropriately and just respect everyone for who they are. It just small, tiny things like that of just being able to be open about who you are is huge. How much it impacts. Yeah, I love that. You guys, we're building like the coolest world. <laughs> like it's a lot of work, but I feel like the world is just getting better because of this kind of work. Um, as our final question, um, what advice would you give to women pursuing careers uh, in theater? Uh, this is whether they're no matter their age or their experience level or um, what do you want to say to women who are interested in this career? 
the million dollar question. <laughs> I think what I would have loved to have heard from a female mentor um, when wanting to pursue theater, what I would have loved to have heard um, is that I am good enough. <laughs> I am good enough. Um, and that the art that I want to explore and um, delve deeper into is worthwhile. And so um, I guess the advice that I would give to um, other women in theater is that you have a voice, it's been given to you. Um, you have experiences that are special to you and unique to you. Um, and you can use that voice to share your story with others. Yes, I love that. Yeah, Chloe. I'm just kind of jumping on yours. Um, don't just, I guess, don't compromise who you are to serve someone else that doesn't serve your own integrity. Um, find things that help to build you up or help challenge you in a positive way um, rather than doing things for the sake of moving up. Because there's a lot of like toxic kind of hierarchies that have been established for decades, centuries, um, and being able to find those avenues of people who will see you for you rather than saying you have to fit into this certain category is really, really important and helps you, I mean, it helps the art become better and it helps kind of the entire community become better as a result. Yes, I love that. Yeah, Deliz. I would say don't play small. Like, I, I feel like it took me, you know, 30 years of my life to figure out that like a huge part of quote unquote success is just confidence. It's just, you know, believing that like, no, this is a thing that I can do and this is something that I deserve. And so I'm going to do it instead of constantly second guessing and wondering, you know, can I do it? Is it, is, do I even deserve to do this? You know, yes, you do. Yes, you can do the thing. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Shelby, you're um, I would say there are a lot of things I'd like to say. I will shorten it um, to two specific points. And one being um, my women in theater that you are incredible and wonderful and that we owe it to every human, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, anything, to continue to educate ourselves and to read and not just educate yourself in your own field, but educate yourself in humanity and society as well and understand where your, um, where your biases come from. Uh, and the sub portion of that being to my women of color in theater, don't straighten your hair. Um, don't feel like you have to lose your curves don't feel like you have to give up your ethnicity to play this white air art air eric erratic character um you that is part of your arsenal and you should not turn that away um please don't think that that's not something you should bring to the table every time you act and then the other portion of that is especially for women in our biases make sure that you're continuing to make your hiring processes a testament to to your promise to women being safe and stop rehiring sexual assaulters stop there's absolutely no reason for it and that if someone has come to you and said this has happened or i know this person has this or this charge believe those women and stop hiring them i don't care if they kill it in this role i don't care if they show up to audition and you feel like they're the right person they're not the right person because there are other people in your show so stop hiring people who have a history of sexual assault yes Amen. It's that that's even a question. <laughs> How about you, Kim? I would just say amen to everything that's been said. Awesome. My advice to any women who want to pursue a career in theater is to stand in the authority of your work. Be willing to listen and be willing to learn. But if you are the person in the room with the expertise, own that expertise. You can still be considerate to others and you can still learn and you can still listen, but women are so often taught to make compromises, 
to make people comfortable. But if you're the sound designer, if you're the director, if you're the intimacy director, if you're the fight choreographer, if you're the playwright, if you are the professor, you hold that authority and you don't need to change your instincts to make someone else, to soothe someone else's ego. <laughs> so that's what I'd say. Go out and be brave and trust your instincts. You guys, this has been an amazing conversation. I feel so, I feel like I've learned so much. Um, all of you who are listening at home, I hope you have been uplifted and enlightened like I have. I don't know if you guys feel that same way. <laughs> I have. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're so excited to have Shelby as our new um, artistic co-director of our company and for um, finding ways for us to continue to be connected uh, in times when we can't make theater the way that we're used to making it. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media, um, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, check out our website that will also have details about our drive-in theater, including details about how we've made sure that this is as COVID safe as it possibly can be. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>